hosting many others, such as Philip Glass. Yet Harry Parch died a nomadic hobo. Here's his story. Once upon a time, there was a little boy, and he went outside. Because that's exactly what I did when I was pretty young. I've been going outside ever since. I went outside in the big ranch country of Arizona. And then later I went outside of music. I guess I'm still going outside. But I'm not a little boy anymore. Many artists draw inspiration from working outside the constraints of the mainstream. Harry Parch positively thrived on it. In a life that spanned much of the 20th century, he rebelled against the hypocrisy and conformism he saw everywhere. He created an obscure, strange, difficult, but always fascinating musical universe in an attempt to exist apart from the modern world. I knew that I was going to be involved with music in some serious way when I was 14. I know I knew it before that, but when I was 14, I began to write music and conceive of dramatic situations. And I said right then and there, I will not be straight jacketed by anyone. I'm going to be completely free. The great thing about Parch is that he just turns everything on its head. He starts out from the premise that everything that we're given about music, everything that you learn about music, which is largely from like the last 300 years of classical music, is a mistake. When I first heard some of his harmonies, my ears just... <laughs> my impression when I first listened to it was one of shock, you know. To, I had to adjust to, to listening. And I looked around and everybody else was doing the same thing. However, in an even length piece, I would say after 10 or 12 minutes, the ears slowly got adjusted to it. And I would say by midway into the piece, you can really listen to it. Harry Parch began his career in a conventional manner, studying music at the University of Southern California in the early 1920s. But he quickly became disillusioned with the whole ethos of the concert music he was being taught. To Parch, this was a middle-class, dead, white European tradition. But I recall going to, a, to the very first Los Angeles Philharmonic, the very first one, I think it was 1919. It was a new organization. And uh, I recall this great body of blue-haired ladies sitting below me. And 45 years later, mind you, I went to another concert in the same city, and behold, the sea of blue. Now, there's nothing wrong with blue-haired red ladies, of course, but if we aren't concerned about our youth, we're headed straight to a dead end. The concert hall tradition represented the status quo, safety and conformism, and only served to spark off Parch's already highly flammable radical spirit. 
But the trouble is the concert hall is really what Parch said. So there are these kind of sacred places for music within a very narrow period, basically roughly 1750 to 1950. And, and uh, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, things he could live without, you know, they're overplayed. Within six months, he dropped out of university and began considering how he might create a new and unique form of composition. Parch had a vague concept that music should be tied to the natural speaking voice, but his ideas were at odds with everything he encountered in the stiflingly provincial musical environment of Los Angeles. Then one day in the mid-1920s, he finally found the answer. It was the key to everything Parch would later do, and it came in the form of a book called On the Sensations of Tone by Hermann Helmholtz. This was, he says, it was, this was the key that I'd been searching for. This was the key that unlocked the door to his whole musical uh, development from that point onwards. It was a very exciting discovery for him because he was looking for something that answered the questions of music theory. Why do we have 12 notes in the octave? Why are all our semitones the same size, etc., etc.? And Helmholtz provided him with a solid scientific explanation for some of those things. After reading Helmholtz's book, Parch felt confirmed in his belief that far from being natural, there was no logical reason for the 12-tone octave that had been the bedrock of Western music for centuries. Parch saw the whole thing as a musical conspiracy. This thing began with truth, and truth does exist. For some hundreds of years, the truth of just intonation has been hidden one could almost say maliciously, because truth always threatens the ruling hierarchy, or they think so. All of the intervals have been tempered or tampered with or slightly distorted from their pure form in order to make all the intervals fit into the space of an octave. And Parch was very keen to abandon that compromise. He didn't like tempered tuning. He didn't like the sound it made. He didn't like the conceptual model that it presented. And he was interested in pure intervals and in extensions of the pure tuning that, for example, the ancient Greeks used for their modes. And in working out a system of pure tuning, he took that out to uh, rather considerable uh, lengths so that you end up getting into the domain of microtones, which are very small intervals between the conventional notes that we're used to. But really, the beginning of his ideas was not from any great interest in microtones for the sake of it, or, or to just have a difficult life for himself. It's because of a sudden realization that the history of, of music is directly related to the natural speaking patterns that we all have. Uh, his own speaking pattern, his own inflections of his voice, as you can hear in any recording, are extremely melodic and dramatic. One of the things that a lot of people find really off-putting about opera is that people speak like this, and they sing in scales, and they even talk in scales. Well, nobody talks in scales. We talk smoothly. And that's really the, the easiest way for me to describe it, that all those notes that we glide through, each one of those could be stopped at a particular moment and be a particular note. And what microtonality tries to do is get to those, uh, capture them, nail them down, and say, OK, this is now a viable, usable tone. So Parch, instead of doing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, goes a lot farther. He goes from that same note, but that's how many in between. Hold on. And finally, <laughs> so we actually have... 43 notes per octave in Parch's scale. Now that Parch had developed a microtonal scale, he had to figure out a way to write it down in notation form. And this was just the first of the challenges he faced working in microtones. Now many people had had this realization in Western music history before him, but they all said, oh, the instruments are, are the given, the voice can fit into those cracks, we can sing. We can sing discrete steps. We can sing them with vibrato, so we can get something in between, too. But Harry said, well, 
what if the voice is right? Then we have to adapt the instruments necessarily. <laughs> Already a composer, Parch then became an instrument maker. The first instrument he built to play his microtonal scale was the adapted viola, so named because that's what it was, a viola with the neck of a cello tuned to Parch's specifications and played between the legs instead of under the chin. The building of this instrument was the crystallization of his musical philosophy. He began to receive recognition from supporters and press, intrigued by his new ideas. But Parch, unwilling to stand still and play to their expectations, instead baffled and alienated many would-be patrons with the actual music. The first work he composed in his new idiom was musical settings to verses by the 8th century Chinese poet Li Po. An encounter in the field. Trampling the fallen flowers of the road, the dangling end of his crop brushes a passing carriage of five colored clouds. The jewel curtain has raised a beautiful. That is my house, she whispers, pointing to a pink house beyond. The choice of Li Po was a deliberate one. Parch's parents had been missionaries in China shortly before his birth, and now Parch was celebrating the very heathens they wanted to convert. Parental influence no doubt contributed to his lifelong dislike of Christianity and the control it represented. Instead, he was drawn to more ancient and exotic cultures. The direction in which I have been going the past 44 years has much in common with the activities and actions of primitive man as I imagine him. It is my strong belief that the human race has known and abandoned magical sounds, visual beauty, and experience ritual more meaningful than those now current. Harry said, this is what I stand for, stepping as many millennia back as I possibly can to ancient Greece, ancient China, or in the ancient native traditions of America. <laughs> Born in 1901 in California and raised in a desert town, Parch had realized from an early age that he was gay, not the best way forward in early 20th century America. His own feelings of existing outside of the acceptable norms of society led him to identify with others viewed in the same way, like the Yaqui Indians who lived in a small enclave in the desert close to his childhood home. His home life was constraining, and as an escape, he looked to archaic cultures which he saw as having more freedom. All his life, Parch used ancient beliefs as a basis for both his music and the way he lived. In 1934, with the assistance of his patrons, he spent a year in London studying ancient concepts of tonality and commissioning his first adapted reed organ, the Chromelodeon. But he wasn't content with just building these strange instruments. He had to continue to push musical boundaries. One interesting thing that the parts did, you know, very carefully, each one of these notes has an exact numerical relationship with everything else. But 
After he built, uh, this by the way is of course a, a modern synthesizer that I have tuned to the 43 note per octave scale. He did it by taking a reed organ and taking each little reed out and retuning it himself by hand. As soon as he did that, he realized he had all these wonderful uh, individual notes, but then he started doing the most amazing things with it. He would do something, I mean, he would smear it and go. Two, three, four. I'd like to do it again. Two, three, four. One, three, four, one. His career was going from strength to strength, and he returned from his European trip in 1935 with high expectations for the future. Unfortunately, the Great Depression badly affected his chance of future sponsorship. The Depression proved to be a boom time for the Hollywood musical. People craved escapism from the turmoil of their daily lives. And the strange musical outpourings of avant-garde composers were out of tune with public tastes. Parch made a decision to become a hobo. Many artists since have paid lip service to life on the road, but few have ever taken it as far as Parch. For the next 10 years or so, he joined the great mass of unemployed people railroading and hitchhiking across the Midwest. Long ago, I said to myself, I think more than anyone else, life is too precious to spend it with important people. There are so many plays for our status and uh, selling and one gets among a group of hobos and among transient orchard workers and right away there's a human contact, which doesn't mean that they always like each other, but there's a human contact without this fighting for place constantly. Uh, it's just a little sidelight on why I felt it necessary during the Depression to be a hobo and take a pack on my back. As a bum, Parch may have been homeless, broke, filthy and starving, but for the first time he felt truly free. He could openly express his sexuality and as a heavy drinker, indulge without the disapproval of the moral majority. This was his chance to completely escape modern society. For over a decade, Parch composed no music, but he stored up experiences of every sort for later use. During the Depression, when one was put upon his own resources so constantly, nobody was writing war and peace, and nobody was doing an unfinished symphony. But in little ways, there was a tremendous amount of creativity. Now, when I say creative, I, I'm, I don't mean poetry or literature or music or any of the things that we think of as the fine arts. I'm just talking about everyday living, like primitive man. <laughs> come into a situation where everyone is a stranger. You have to make a decision very fast. And uh, you can say, hey, Mac, uh, will you watch my pack while I go into town? And just suddenly like this. And I've never been let down, never. Of course, hobos are extraordinarily uh, individualistic people. That's why they're hobos. They cannot conform to the society that the strictures of a city you never find them in to speak of. I'm talking about the Depression, which is what I know best. Uh, but I doubt if people have changed. In other words, what I'm saying is that, that uh, there are the same kinds of people of today. The there are the same kinds of people who have got to go out on the road and thumb their nose at society and say, I am going to, I'm going to do everything by myself. River, Y, O, Mer. He had no money, so when he would we cross the country back and forth. Whenever he needed money, he would get off and either wash dishes or pick cotton. He didn't believe in work as a 
ethic for himself. The only work he'd ever done was early in his life, he'd been a proofreader in Oakland at the newspaper. But other, otherwise, he did these two manual jobs just to earn enough money to, to survive. It's a, it's a year he didn't talk much about, I mean, it's a decade that he didn't talk much about, but it uh, left its mark on him, for sure. It's pretty tough to be right in the drags on a night like this. I know I was a bum once myself. It was a, a traumatic existence for him. He almost froze to death on several occasions. Uh, he contracted syphilis and all kinds of related health problems. And I imagine that for some of that period, he must have despaired of ever being able to go back to his music. Yesterday I washed all my clothes in the Roseville jungle. The Depression was a time of sacrifice, but Parch never stopped being an artist. Amazingly, he continued to build instruments. He kept a journal called Bitter Music, in which he drew pictures of life on the road, kept a diary, and wrote down the inflections of individual hobos' speech patterns. These would fuel the compositions like U.S. Highball and Barstow that he later wrote about his decade on the road. I can stand that. And the dirt. Everything but the church. He uh, became involved in music on the road. He heard music, he heard the patter of different voices. Uh, act different accents uh, from town to town. It was his organic, you know, an organic music lesson. My first contact with his music was, the real contact was the, this piece Barstow, which was um, hitchhiker inscriptions written down on a highway railing and then set to music. And the way he set them, they were like folk songs, like Woody Guthrie folk songs. She rose from her blanket with a gun in each hand said come all of you cowboys fight for your land going home to Boston Yaha Massachusetts it's 4 p.m. and I'm hungry and broke It's the, uh, it's the quality of the human voice. Uh, there's also the rather kind of uh, tangential and sort of ephemeral quality of the texts themselves, which are you know, collected in this rather haphazard way. And I think the accompaniment, uh, particularly like the kind of harmonium sound, um, and the way in which the intervals are gradually, gradually shifting. Yo -ho -ho, yo -ho -ho, yo -ha -ha, yo -ha Go to 530 East Lemon Avenue in Monrovia for an easy handout, gentlemen. Yo -ho -ho, yo -ho -ho, yo -ha -ha, yo -ha I like the sort of implied narrative in it. Also, the fact it, it has this resonance with Parch's past about, you know, traveling across the country on flat cars, right, living the life of a hobo. It has that sort of rather romantic quality to it. I want my one, one half of desert to the east, then back to L.A. to try once more. Car just passed by. Make that two more. Three more. Johnny Ride Walt, 915 South Westlake Avenue, Los Angeles. Do -de -do -de -do -de -do. During rare moments of stability, Parch persisted in building instruments. 
His supporters also continued to champion his ideas, and in 1943, he was awarded a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation in New York. He could now leave the road for good with a set of bigger and ever more elaborate instruments. to be able to use one of them. This is the 1938 Cathara that he built himself in, in Los Angeles in, the, in an adult school uh, wood shop. I've built three Catharas since 1938, and these three are probably the first that have been built in the last 1,500 years. The Cathara is a lyre, the instrument used by the professional Greek musician. The lyre of Orpheus had three strings. The traditional number of strings was eight, but lyres were experimented with, of course. One of the very famous experimenters was Timotheus from Sparta, of all places, who increased the number of Cathara strings from eight to 12. For the crime of 12 strings, the Spartans drove the immoral Timotheus from their city. He had failed to realize that to dream of desirable changes is one thing, to act upon those dreams is another. My Cathara has 72 strings, and I shudder to think what might have happened to me in ancient Greece. Basically, it's, uh, it's a bunch of guitars strung up right away because his whole concept of a chord uh, is a hexad, six notes. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. In this case, all just intonation, the root, third, fifth, seventh, ninth, and eleventh harmonic for the musicians that understand that language. That was something new because usually on the piano or in harmony, you only deal with one, three, and five. We doubled that number. And here they are. One of the pieces that he wrote early on was something called The Letter, which was a setting of a, a letter got from a hobo friend. The original version is for cathar and guitar. I usually play the guitar part, but at least you get an idea from it. Also an idea about his harmony, because here, for example, is a chord, another chord, a minor chord, and a major chord, but they're very close. And what he does is run them against one another. Cincinnati, Ohio, October 2nd, 1935, hello, pal. Glad to hear from you. Believe it or not, pal, I just received your letter today. It must have followed me all over the world. But it got to my wife. She wrote it open and read it and sent it to me this morning. Well, I came back to East and run into a shotgun wedding, and I was the gold. Parch was always interested in the way his instruments looked. He was concerned as much with their visual beauty as with the sounds they made. It's a curious fact that the wine and liquor bottles will give approximately the same frequency under each brand name. For example, the lowest tone is an old heavenly old sour mash. The top is a 
uh, Bristol Cream Sherry. And uh, if you run out, if you don't get exactly this, the right tone here or the right tone here, you simply ask your friends to save your old Heaven Hill or whatever bottles. There was a dark humor in some of his instrument building, such as the cloud chamber bowls, which took something destructive, Pyrex carboys used in atomic experiments, and put them to creative use. because of the seven brass artillery casings hanging here. And how much better to have them hang here than shredding young men's bodies on the battlefield. I think Harry Potter's instruments are absolutely important. He talked about himself as being what a philosopher, a carpenter seduced into philosophy or vice versa, I can't remember. But uh, his instruments are just very beautiful to look at and incredibly interesting to hear. You know, the man had a wonderful ear. He was a great craftsman. If for nothing else, he should be remembered for having, actually having made and invented these astonishingly beautiful instruments. Now, with the new instruments, the style of the music was beginning to change from vocal to instrumental works. The sheer size of the instruments compelled musicians to move in a different way, which led to a new form of performance part dance and part ritual theatre. He developed a quite elaborate idea which he called corporeality, which has to do with the attitude of the performing musician on stage, that the musicians have to use their whole bodies in performing, not merely their arms. I like to think of uh, what I'm doing as visual and corporeal and uh, I want the instruments on stage, and I want them to be beautiful. I also want the, uh, the uh, musicians to be a, a, an active part, a, a very active part in the, the whole production. Their attitude, their posture at the instrument, uh, I, especially on the large instruments, it's very important that their footwork is good. And uh, I want them to be as graceful as Muhammad Ali. Uh, and uh, actually, maybe I ought to give them some exercise of skipping rope. <laughs> um, and I also like them to be in costume and uh, with, with a headdress uh, or, or whatever, just to get away from the mundane and the pedestrian. And, and the, uh, because uh, I'm not suggesting that everyone follow my lead, not by any means. I know that there are many paths to perception. I believe in pluralism, but my uh, direction, where I'm at, is in ancient ritual in modern terms. And in ancient ritual, uh, primitive, primitive ritual, everything was involved. Uh, the, the, the whole village, the whole, anything in art, everything in dance, and in music. The musicians must be visually on stage, dynamic in form, in costume, athletic in their grace, and they must move around the instruments as though they're uh, heavily involved. They may whistle, shout, sing, stamp their feet, take off their clothes or half of their costume and become naked, and you didn't care which half. <laughs> He talks about how it's uh, to, to not perform in a physically involved corporeal manner is just as bad as if, as if you muff the notes. And he talks about hanging up by the gonads with a, a cathara string, anyone who would perform like that. For the few people who saw these multimedia productions in the 1950s, it was an experience unlike anything else. I was 
uh, present at a performance of The Bewitched, which was a music theater piece that Karch had composed. It was the first uh, real music theater piece I had seen, which was truly new, uh, which was neither a, a Broadway show or a traditional opera or a straight play, uh, but in fact was a, conceived, uh, a piece conceived in a whole new way of thinking about theater. But the expense, time and commitment that was involved in staging a performance meant that very few were actually given. At about the same time, Parch began to release records from his home in San Francisco because no music publisher would touch him. However, he was desperate to find other ways of displaying the multimedia aspects of his work. My music and my instruments are the expression of an ancient tradition in which sight and sound unite toward the achievement of a single dramatic purpose. This is not concert music. It finds its highest purpose in collaboration with other arts, with dance, with tragedy, with satire, with farce, and in the present instance, with the art of film. Parch quickly saw the possibilities of marrying his music to film. He began to collaborate with Madeleine Tortolo, a filmmaker who worked in the American tradition of experimental film that included Maya Deren and Kenneth Anger. One of the first films they made together was of a performance of Parch's composition, Rotate the Body. It was recorded mostly live during an international gymnastics meet. The corporeal side of the work was now being taken by the vaulting and tumbling athletes. The film that was made of that uh, performance, he regarded as one of the most beautiful of the films of his works. The making of uh, Rotate was also interesting because that was an international meeting uh, at the height of the Cold War and it so happened that the Soviet team was opening the show as well. The first time and it was all very politically sensitive uh, and they opened the show with, uh, I don't know, some tinny Soviet music, whatever that was. And then a little bit later they unveiled the curtain and there were the perch instruments and they were suddenly afraid that this was some kind of anti-communist plot that was being foisted upon them. It's really a, a ballet for gymnasts, as he calls it, a study in the human form and athletic grace. Uh, it seems kind of silly to us now and, and even gymnastics has, has improved since then, I'm told. Uh, but he loved that film. Other films paid homage to the ancient Greek sources of Parch's musical philosophy. Windsong, which starred Madeleine Tortolo herself, was based on the legend of Daphne and Apollo. Small audiences of artists and bohemians in loft spaces and galleries in the major east and west coast cities were the only people to see these films. Parch and Tortolo went on to make six films together, but by the end, he became disillusioned with the collaborative process. However, Parch had a knack for finding new supporters or patrons to replace those who fell by the wayside. The philanthropist Betty Freeman was his next benefactor, and, as it turned out, his last. I knew about him from the underground music world for years before I'd met him. 
uh, I'd never heard any of his mu music, but I always knew that there was this uh, legendary, already legendary character someplace in the Midwest, Northern California. And when I met Harry, um, I, I really loved him. I really, really did. He, um, he was charming. He was beautiful. He looked to me just like God in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel with Adam. He um, was intelligent. He was creative. Um, on, the, on the other side, he, um, I didn't think he was eccentric. People say he was eccentric. For me, he wasn't eccentric because almost everybody I know is eccentric. <laughs> it's what they call eccentric. It isn't eccentric. It's, he was original and an original thinker. Uh, one, one day, and he, um, yeah, he really changed my life. One, one day he said to me, what are the five most evil words in the English language? So I said, I don't know. So he said, they're from the, uh, from the New Testament. A go and sin no more. And I know exactly what he meant. Parch was unhappy in his studio because he felt it was too small, and perhaps more importantly, because it was too far from a liquor store. So Betty Freeman set him up in a new studio, a disused laundrette in the Venice Beach area of LA, which was not the desirable location it is today. He said in a letter, there was a wild Saturday night here while I was in San Diego. No, don't forget, this is the 1960s in Los Angeles. It was a pretty wild time. Negro teenagers began throwing rocks at my plate glass windows. They also shoved lighted firecrackers through my mail chute. After I returned, there was a two-car crash right in my parking lot. Not Negroes, <coughs> just poor Caucasian trash. I feel terrible that so much money was spent on this place to make it pleasant and livable. The bad things happen only at night when I am, or would be, quite alone. I can't decide to, when to give notice. So what he did, it's very funny, he decided to electrify his windows because the bums in the area, don't forget this was a time of drugs, the bums in the area urinated against the window beside these terrible things. And so he was going to electrify the windows so they would be electrocuted <laughs> when they, they urinated. I think he was talked out of that, but he, that was his plan. By the mid-60s, he was as secure professionally as he had ever been, supported by universities and receiving a publishing deal. The growing counterculture movement was, superficially at least, changing society on an almost hourly basis. Outsider voices, previously either marginalized or simply mocked, were now being declared the new saviors of humanity and all that. This tongue must vibrate at virtually the same frequency as this cavity. And so you can say, you can say, the tongue must couple with the cavity or there's no resonant tone. And uh, yes, this is very sexy. In music, Parch and others of his generation, including Henry Cowell, Lou Harrison and John Cage, were cited as major influences by a new wave of American minimalist composers. They didn't fit in anywhere. They didn't fit into music schools. They didn't fit into concert programs, mostly. This is, uh, let's say, the maverick tradition of American music, which is ex extremely exhilarating uh, and wonderful and needs to be it has to be sought out. It's like looking for rare mushrooms. But uh, they, you don't find them on every street corner. Uh, but they are true treasures, and they're, tr they're truly unique. They're, uh, they're profoundly American in a way. What these composers had in common, probably all they had in common, was that they came from the west coast of America, the home of alternative ideas, from the hippie and dippy to the musical influence of Eastern art and philosophy. Chinatown itself in San Francisco was a source of Asian music because at that time uh, the uh, merchants were, they would play viols and flutes and things while they were waiting for customers. So at almost any time you walk down the street and you'd hear Chinese music being played. It's out here, of course, we were only an ocean away from, <laughs> just as in New York, they're only an ocean away from Europe. 
<laughs> a lot of the kind of interesting crazes tend to come from the West Coast. A lot of the uh, you know independent people in terms of um, minimal music come from that side. Parch had mixed feelings about this new level of popularity. After years of being a happy outsider, he found himself being invited inside, but he preferred to remain distant. Parch resented being compared to anyone else, particularly John Cage. didn't like John Cage's music at all. He had no interest in or sympathy for chance operations in music. The whole uh, Cage style indeterminacy or experimentalism left him completely cold. He thought that you know to stop making choices about music was the same thing as to stop making music. So he was quite opposed to Cage, was indeed rather resentful, I think, of the amount of attention Cage was getting uh, from the media and from critics and from other composers. Harry just couldn't withhold himself from saying, what does he call this? What kind of charlatanism is this? He's getting all of this media attention for this radical new thing. And what has he done? What has he done to compel an audience to grip their seats and, uh, and be uh, entranced by a piece of music uh, from beginning to end? He's just a charlatan. He's a showman, and he's getting, uh, getting, he's getting away with it. So to, to Harry, Cage was just a, 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 an empty showman. One composer he did get on with was Lou Harrison, who, like Parch, was greatly influenced by tuning and instruments from non-Western cultures. Harrison was the greatest lyrical composer of the 20th century, according to Harry Parch. They were great friends. Well, if you want, I can read this poem about him, which I did in 1978. They're called Lines of Eleven and Eight on Harry Parch. Now there's a thing there. Harry Parch limited his tuning system to eight, which is the basic octave, and the eleventh overtone. He never went beyond the eleventh overtone, so that's why I did that. <clears throat> Warm, wonderful Harry Parch in recent times has made his lovely life's music entirely true in ratios and has told us of these perfections in a book. Of Helmholtz, he said, that's what got me started, just as he has started others. This succession, this new breed of musicians at the source of tones and tuning, fired by the zest and gusto of Harry's work, draws nurture from the ground of art. Thus we compose continuance from his start, more fully than for centuries. Such history perhaps must follow from him that tune and tuning shall conjoin. Harry in silver beard and shod in sandals, beautiful in his older years, remembers his earlier hobo journeys and the tensions of his childhood. Though drinker of strong drinks only, he remains affectionate even in cups, forms swift loving loyalties to whom he likes, and the young come to him always. He joins together our brains and ears and flesh. He is a body sweet and slim, and as he talks and teaches, fully absorbed, he slightly chants his sentences. He grasps and holds us in a sweet reminder that, yes, it is our flesh that knows all these lovely ratios, as we know also blooms and loves and tunes and sunlight. Well, like that bar, you can't play around with it, up and down, up and down. I mean, you can't tilt it constantly. Oh, okay. you, It's got to be at a constant angle. That's better. There you go. Good. To publicize Parch's work, his patron Betty Freeman decided to produce a film about him. She hired young director Stephen Puglio, and filming began early in 1972. It was the last great drama of Parch's life. Oh boy, you really have to hug it, don't you? Harry was one of the most loving people that I've ever met, and he embraced life with such gusto 
Um, I always felt more alive when I was with him, really, than anyone else. Although I was fascinated by his music, I was more intrigued with who he was. To me, he was a, ma a magician. Love, oh, love, oh, careless love. Love, oh, love. Some that were coming up with careless love. You see what love has done to me. Harry fell in love with me. So this made the filming of The Dreamer That Remains very complicated. You read about, you know, uh, I mentioned that he loved Greek literature and, and Greek history, and, and I felt that the love was of another era, in a way. Um, sexually, there was, it was, we had a platonic relationship, but he was passionate about our friendship. And uh, I could only reassure him that I, you know, I, in my own way, I wanted to return his affection. Do not loiter around other public buildings. Do not loiter even in public parks where a couple of people want to improve the darkness with a little loving. Now, isn't that nice and friendly? I remember one morning waking up at his house. I slept on the back porch, and I woke up, and I woke up in gardenia petals. I was surrounded by gardenia petals, and I got up, and the gardenia petals turned to rose petals, and they there was a trail all the way to the kitchen where he had breakfast waiting for me. And so he spoiled me and uh, in the most wonderful ways. Um, I am the dreamer that remains. He dedicated the piece to me and uh, built an instrument called the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was a gift from Parch to Puglio. It was a wind chime in which the chimes, perhaps a little unsubtly, were eleven fallacies. I was not returning with the love as much as I probably should have. And uh, he always talked about the loved and the beloved. I was the beloved, and, and he said a lot of, I'm going to have to just stop, that's, yeah, and we're going to places that it's really tough. Parch was drinking more than ever, and the relationship between him and Puglio intensified. It came to a head one night in a San Diego motel. The evening before the last day uh, of, of filming, uh, I went to bed and, and he stayed up in the, in the living room and I woke up that night out of like a dream and I, I heard this tremendous argument in the living room and at first I thought that Danley or somebody had come in and something was wrong with the film. But then I realized it was Harry and Harry was using two voices and there was an argument and it had to do Part of it had to do with me, part of it had to do with the film, his life, uh, and I felt this pagan moment, and a lot of people said that he had pagan contacts. But there was a mystery that I will never be able to comprehend that evening. I woke up the next morning, he was gone, and when I returned to the room, there was an ice pick in my pillow. Um, and he used that ice pick to clean his pipe, but um, it scared me. Uh, and our relationship, of course, wasn't quite the same afterwards. After the trauma of the dreamer that remains, Parch was demoralized. He was nearing the end of his life, and he had begun to worry about his legacy. What would become of his instruments? Would they end up in a museum, never to be played? And how could such an insular, self-contained world survive?
After a lifetime swimming against the current, Parch died of a heart attack in the autumn of 1974. He was 73. But there is always a dream. Dan Lee Mitchell became custodian of his instruments. I had been working with Harry for m many years in the latter, latter part of his life, and yes, there was an understanding that I would take his instruments and carry on. Harry oftentimes wondered if it wouldn't, wasn't a curse to have all of this responsibility of a, of, a, of a collection of instruments that needed 2,000 square feet of storage. To Gentlemen. And the performances continued. Today, more instruments are being built, and his compositions are widely available on CD. Go to 530 East Lemon Avenue in Monrovia for an easy handout, gentlemen. Go to 530 East Lemon Avenue in Monrovia for an easy handout, gentlemen. Some performers have elected to use conventional instruments, but the original instruments are still very much in use. Parch always claimed that he didn't want disciples. And he said in one famous occasion that if anybody claims to have been a disciple of mine, I'll happily strangle them. And he meant that he didn't necessarily think that his own tools, as he put it, and his own instruments, the scales and so forth, uh, were necessarily things that other people should use. I mean, those were his own solutions to the problem of making music. And after his death, some people have indeed written for his instruments. Some people have used more or less his own ideas about tuning, in some cases extended them further. But I think almost more important than that literal usage of his work is the example he provides of doing a very creative, very non-institutionalized sort of music making that always seems to look for a place outside any of the prevailing fashions of the day, no matter what they might be. And to me, the great inspiration that he still provides is this idea that it's possible to do music outside of the, the dictates of, of convention. Every man is a mystery.